When the Joker movie came out in 2019, I remember a lot of people worrying that it glorified violence. While that worry is understandable given instances of copycat violence in the United States, it's telling that this worry wasn't apparent anywhere near to the same extent when The Dark Knight came out, a movie which could also be said to glorify violence, in which the ethically ambiguous but sympathetic titular character brutalizes a person who's under arrest as part of an interrogation, a form of violence that is very real and very common in the United States. Batman in The Dark Knight was just as willing to use violence as the Joker, the difference being that he used violence for the sake of law and order. Of course, the person being brutalized was the Joker, someone who's evil, a villain, a criminal, and so undeserving of our sympathy. The same kind of excuses we might hear about real-world cases of police brutality. And so a Hollywood movie teaches us to allow human rights violations here and there, just so long as its victims are deemed evil enough, and we are taught to trust powerful, unaccountable people, not subject to any form of democratic control, to be able to decide for us exactly who is evil enough. The Joker in The Dark Knight is presented exactly the way the state wants us to view criminals and enemies of the state, and what makes The Joker from 2019 politically significant is that it completely subverts this presentation by contextualizing the Joker in real, working-class life. My thesis in this video will thus be that The Dark Knight from 2008 and Joker from 2019 in fact represent opposing class standpoints. There have already been a lot of analyses and commentaries on the right-wing politics of The Dark Knight. It, for instance, seems to defend the old platonic idea of the noble lie, lying to the population for the sake of political stability. In this case, you have District Attorney Harvey Dent lying about being Batman, a cop faking his own death, and finally, that same cop lying about the crimes of Harvey Dent so that Gotham's population continues to view him positively as a public figure. An act based on the common idea that the masses need to be lied to and deceived because they are not mature enough to handle the truth. Not to mention, that lie is then used to fuel support for the Dent Act, which denies parole to prisoners. Then there is a clear reference to things like the so-called Patriot Act, surveillance of private citizens, the violation of people's privacy for the sake of preventing crime and terror. In this case, Batman uses private data from the phones of all of Gotham's citizens in order to locate the Joker. He admits that it's unethical, but makes an exception for it, believing to be justified as a necessary evil in this particular case. So, lying to the public, violent interrogation, and invasive surveillance are all used for the sake of maintaining law and order. Though, of course, this is a superhero movie and things like that don't happen in real life. As has been pointed out a million times, the Batman is also a billionaire, a member of Gotham's ruling class, who was born into wealth, and uses military-grade technology to beat up criminals, most of whom, in all likelihood, have themselves been victims of Gotham's disintegrating social conditions. Conditions that Bruce Wayne's wealth has for the most part shielded him from. But what I'd like to emphasize here most of all is the way the movie presents the Joker. The Joker has no past, no origin. We are shown nothing about his life that would allow us to relate to him or sympathize with him. Even when he talks about his past, namely about how he got his scars, he tells two conflicting stories about them, meaning that we cannot even trust him when it comes to his own life experiences. He lies and uses violence, which of course the forces of law and order do too, but the Joker uses it for the sake of chaos. As a concrete human being, the Joker is empty and undefined. He's not given a name or any clear motivations. The only thing that defines him is that he is an agent of chaos. And this, by no accident, is exactly how the state and the ruling class wants people to view criminals. Not as human beings with the past, with their own desires and motivations, not as people who have been conditioned by the circumstances they were born into, not as people who themselves might have been victims, but rather agents of chaos, pure and simple. Because if we view the criminal not as a human being with relatable experiences and desires, but as a purely evil embodiment of chaos, 
we are less likely to empathize with them, and we are then more likely to be okay with their rights being violated when, for example, they are brutalized during an interrogation. If we see criminals as villains who simply want to watch the world burn, as Alfred puts it, then we're a lot less likely to object when the police force is increasingly expanded and militarized. This is where the significance of Joker from 2019 comes in. It takes a villain and not only humanizes him by giving him a past and a name, Arthur Fleck, but also contextualizes him socially, and by doing that puts the spotlight away from his individual moral character and places it on the kind of social circumstances that lead people to turn to crime and violence in the first place. Some people have criticized the movie for perpetuating the stereotype that mentally ill people are violent, when, of course, in truth, they are more likely to be victims of violence than its perpetrators. But whatever faults the movie might have in its portrayal of mental illness, what it does present accurately is just how many things have to go wrong for an already vulnerable person to turn to violence. This is also why I think it might be misleading to focus on cinema as the cause of people's propensity towards violence. For a person to be pushed into committing a mass shooting by a Hollywood movie they saw, there must have already been such a colossal failure on the part of numerous social institutions that to focus on a particular movie they saw seems absurd. We already live in a world where violence is an unquestioned part of mundane life, whether that violence comes from lone actors or the state. What was most notable to me is that every step that brings Arthur Fleck closer to violence is an outcome of concrete material factors. Material factors that wide sections of the population have to deal with. He lives in poverty, gets fired from his job, and ends up being unable to access medication or counseling when the city cuts funding for social services. All of these factors are further intensified by his social isolation, which, it must be pointed out, is itself a material factor, one which itself is intensified by poverty, unemployment, and mental illness. People often fail to recognize that those who suffer from social isolation are also victims of capitalism, as capitalism is a force of social disintegration, which has been weakening social ties since its birth. The very birth of capitalism in Europe was predicated on the enclosure movement, which broke up communal village life by turning communal land into private property, which in America was done through colonialism and genocide. The forces of social disintegration further accelerated in the second half of the 20th century, causing a rapid decline in family ties, communal ties, and public life in general. Wherever it expands, capitalism destroys social ties so as to turn them into economic ones. And the social isolation which this causes can be deadly, as it increases the likelihood of not only mental illness, but physical illness as well. It has been estimated to decrease one's life expectancy by 15 years. And once the Joker is given a social existence, suddenly we are able to relate to him to at least some extent. We don't have to justify his actions or feel pity for him, but we are able to see ourselves in the social challenges that he faces. And once the social conditions that created him are placed in the forefront, Batman, whose solution would be to swoop in with expensive weapons and beat the Joker up, suddenly seems like a violent villain himself. In other words, when the villains and criminals are revealed to be the poor, the suffering, and the mentally ill, the alleged heroes are simultaneously revealed to be villains. It is not accidental that Joker is set in 1981, with Gotham essentially being New York, where there really was a garbage strike in 1981, and more importantly, it was the year that Ronald Reagan was elected president. Now, I'm really sorry for being a video essays cliché here, but there's no way I can avoid mentioning the word here with how central it is to the movie. Neoliberalism. Reagan was the embodiment of neoliberalism in the United States, and his presidency oversaw extensive cuts on public spending, as well as an attack on the organized working class. As soon as his presidency began, he cut funding for Medicaid, food stamps, school lunch programs, benefits for the poor, and tightened access to unemployment benefits. By 1982, unemployment in the U.S. rose to 10.8%, the highest it had been since the end of World War II, 
From 1980 to 81 alone, there was a 7.4% increase in poverty, with an increase of 2.2 million people living below the poverty line. And such decaying social conditions, coupled with a lack of public support and social services, it shouldn't be a surprise that the decade would see the eruption of crime waves, especially in low-income neighborhoods. Addressing crime by treating its root social causes, however, is not profitable enough. Instead, the state's response is to increase and intensify its own violence through punitive measures. Therefore, amidst all the public cuts, the 80s did see an increase in police funding, as well as, of course, a highly profitable increase in the prison population. As shown in this chart, while welfare funding stagnated, funding for law and order drastically took off at the start of the 80s. The militarization of police and mass incarceration was the state's preferred method for managing a social crisis, until it became the country with the highest prison population in the world, and its police force became the world's third largest military force. It is clear to see, then, that the state's solution was entirely in line with Batman's. Equip yourself with military-grade technology, police the streets, beat people up, and incarcerate them in prisons that are more effective at producing criminals than rehabilitating them. In The Dark Knight Rises, there's a scene where Bruce Wayne's broken back is fixed by being punched. As ridiculous as that may seem, that is also how the US state tends to fix social problems, by punching at them. The subjective flip side of the kind of material conditions described here is a sense of estrangement, in other words, alienation, a condition without which it is impossible to understand today's epidemic of mental illness. And it is no accident that, as a social condition, it came to be widely discussed with the spread of modern capitalism. One of the most influential accounts of alienation is the one laid out by the young Marx in his unpublished Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, in which he used alienation to characterize the condition experienced by the wage worker, who, under a capitalist system, is alienated in four ways. Alienated from the product of their work, because it belongs not to them but to the capitalist who employs them, alienated from the act of work itself, in which they are subject to the will of the capitalist, alienated from themselves, and finally alienated from other equally alienated people, most of whom appear as competitors in the labor market rather than fellow human beings. Although Arthur Fleck being a service worker does not produce a physical object to be alienated from, the other three forms of alienation are clearly visible. He is alienated from his work. The very first time we see him at work, he is made to stand on the street holding a sign advertising a going out of business sale. He is thus reduced to a signpost, reduced to an object. This is simultaneously alienation from what Marx would call his species being, the human capacity for self-conscious and self-directed creative activity, which allows the person to see themselves reflected in the results of their activity. What could be an outlet for his human capacity for creativity instead reduces him to a function that could be carried out by an inanimate object. He is finally alienated from his co-workers, who, rather than granting him solidarity, see him only as competition, and one of them therefore sets him up to get fired. In the latter half of the 20th century, feelings of alienation seem to become even more widespread, or in any case more acutely felt and many thinkers sought to modify and extend Marx's account of alienation beyond the sphere of capitalist wage labor, to create a more universal account of what constitutes alienation. One of these thinkers was Erich Fromm, a German-born psychologist who came to prominence in the United States, and one of several theorists to combine Marxism with psychoanalysis. He devised an account of alienation which, although it could be criticized for its lack of historical specificity, seems particularly helpful in framing the case of Arthur Fleck. Eric Fromm described alienation as, quote, a mode of experience in which the person experiences himself as an alien. He has become, one might say, estranged from himself. He does not experience himself as the center of his world, as the creator of his own acts. But his acts and their consequences have become his masters, whom he obeys or whom he may even worship. Thus we see Arthur Fleck's life being at the mercy of circumstances to a growing degree. 
from his childhood abuse to poverty to unemployment to untreated mental illness, his capacity for control rapidly disintegrates, reducing him to a passive object, someone who is a victim of one's life rather than its master. Arthur's first coping mechanism against alienation is to attribute all his wishes, hopes, the capacities he is unable to develop to another person, in this case a celebrity, the talk show host Murray Franklin. Eric Fromm would refer to this by the psychoanalytic term transference, and he saw it as a form of idolatry, which he sometimes equated with alienation. Whatever Arthur lacks in life, he seeks it by submitting to an idol, a coping mechanism that is extremely prevalent in celebrity culture to this day. Fromm argues that the creation of idols has the aim of finding an answer to the uncertainty of life by transforming a person, an institution, an idea into an absolute, i.e. into an idol by the submission to which the illusion of certainty is created. Idolatry is not only illusory, but entirely one-sided, and fails to create genuine connections. Arthur Fleck seems to be stuck in a row of one-sided relationships, from his admiration of Murray Franklin, to his pursuit of Bruce Wayne, whom he believes to be his father, to his romantic relationship with the neighbor that turns out to be a complete delusion. Idolatry thus only further contributes to alienation, as the idol worshipper places themselves at the mercy of the idol, remaining in a state of passivity and submission. Quote, the more powerful an idol becomes, that is, the more I transfer to it, the poorer I become and the more I am dependent on it, since I am lost if I lose that onto which I have transferred everything that I have. And this is exactly what happens to Arthur Fleck. As he comes to realize that Murray Franklin falls short of the ideal Arthur Fleck saw in him, that his idealization of Murray is a falsehood, his idol shatters. He then redirects his idolatry towards Bruce Wayne, from whom he expects fatherly love, and is once again severely disappointed. At that point, nothing stands between Arthur Fleck and the abyss that is his life. Eric Fromm writes that we are thrown into the world as if by accident, born into circumstances we didn't choose, in conditions we cannot control. And in response to this existential condition, we all seek what he calls transcendence. That is, the desire to rise above one's circumstances, to take control of them, to be a master over one's circumstances rather than their victim, to become active rather than passive. The ideal way of doing this is through creativeness, to create something out of one's circumstances, whether that is an object, an idea, or a loving relationship. To be a creator is to raise oneself, quote, beyond the passivity and accidentalness of one's existence into the realm of purposefulness and freedom. However, not everyone has the opportunity or the capacity to create, and when the creative route is blocked, there is one other option, much easier to attain, but also much more harmful, destructiveness. Now the person who cannot live productively, who cannot create at all, nevertheless does not want to be a passive person like dice thrown out of a cup he wants to transcend but if i cannot create i transcend my creature status also if i destroy mm -hmm. to destroy life is as much of a transcendence of life as to create it mm -hmm. to create requires conditions of interest of capacity many conditions to destroy requires only one thing, a pistol or a strong arm, if your opponent is weaker. But in the process of destruction, I also fulfill the desire to transcend life, uh, to transcend my passive creature status, and I triumph over life. It is my vengeance, you might say my vengeance against life for not permitting me to be oriented to it productively. And therefore I think destructiveness is one of the deepest forms of mental pathology. To destroy life makes me also transcend it. Indeed, that man can destroy life is just as miraculous a feat as that he can create it, for life is the miracle, the inexplicable. In the act of destruction, man sets himself above life. This is how Eric Fromm explains the violent will to destroy seen throughout human history, and this is exactly the route taken by Arthur Fleck. His need to transcend his circumstances is intense and acute, 
as at every turn he feels himself to be a victim of circumstance. He therefore attempts to create, to create a career, to create comedy, to create relationships, and all of these attempts fail. He then opts for the only method of transcendence seemingly left open to him, destruction. While creation is immensely difficult, destruction is easy, and by destroying, Arthur Fleck rises above that which he destroys. It is notable that it is precisely after his acts of murder that Arthur for the first time explicitly expresses confidence. For the first time, he feels powerful because, if nothing else, he has the power to destroy, even if he ultimately destroys the very possibility of his own happiness. After committing murder, Arthur tells his therapist that he hadn't even been sure if he existed, and now, for the first time, he is certain of it. But the problem with psychiatry as it is often understood and practiced today is not reducible merely to the question of funding. Eric Fromm argues that there is a deeper problem. That is, most institutional psychiatry seeks to adjust the individual so as to fit them into the society they inhabit, reducing mental health to mere functioning. But this is not a solution if our society itself is sick. What makes Eric Fromm radical as a psychologist is his belief that mental health is not about adjusting the individual to the society they inhabit, but rather adjusting society to the needs of human individuals. And this is also the difference between Joker and the Dark Knight. In the Dark Knight, Joker must be defeated so as to save society. But the Joker of 2019 is an internal expression of the fact that society itself is broken. The Dark Knight Rises is arguably even more ideological than The Dark Knight, featuring a bizarre allusion to the French Revolution that Christopher Nolan drew from Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. Bane seemingly represents the French revolutionary Robespierre. He frees prisoners, alluding to the storming of the Bastille, and uses populist rhetoric about wealth inequality, corruption, and oppression. Now, having a revolutionary as a villain could have made a really interesting plotline for a Batman movie, raising all kinds of questions about society's structural problems, collective action, and the extent to which political violence is called for in a truly corrupt society. But those kinds of questions would undermine the very ideology propping up the trilogy, and so they must be blocked. Instead, Bane is made out to be using revolutionary rhetoric only as a dishonest tactic, with his true motive being the destruction of Gotham using a nuclear bomb. This plotline is completely ridiculous except as a representation of how right-wing counter-revolutionaries view revolutionaries, as immoral duplicitous villains, who talk of freedom and liberation, but in truth want nothing but the destruction of civilization. Their critique, as always, tries to redirect the focus away from society's social conditions and material problems, and to the immoral character of the revolutionary, who must be stopped and punished to restore law and order. It is quite jarring how The Dark Knight Rises presents a revolution. It shows social unrest, prisoners being freed, people's courts set up, the buildings of the rich being occupied, suggesting that it really is a popular revolution, that it has popular support. But what it never shows even once is the revolutionary masses as a subject, we aren't shown what the people engaged in the revolution think about it, what their relation to Bane is, what kind of living conditions led them to join the revolution, or the forms of organization they use. It all kinda just comes out of nowhere, as if entire sections of the population were driven to revolution as unwitting dupes merely because of Bane's agitation. This is again completely unrealistic, but it is exactly how anti-revolutionaries view the revolution as something organized by outside agitators, because there's no way that the masses have the capacity to form their own political consciousness or create political organizations for their own goals. It is really a form of great man theory, that is, history is shaped not by the masses, but by powerful influential individuals, Batman on the one hand, Bane on the other. The masses exist only as ignorant background characters that are there to support either one or the other. Batman is there to rescue the people, Bane is there to destroy them, but they both ultimately seek power over them, and the people themselves are just passive objects caught in the midst of their struggle. Perhaps the most ideological moment in the movie is the scene where Gotham's police force form a crowd and charge at Bane and his mercenaries. 
Realistically, this scene makes no sense. Cops have weapons, military-grade equipment, and at least some tactical training. You would expect them to enter armed conflict with some degree of tactical formation, or at least to take cover and assume firing positions. Instead, they move as a crowd. This makes no sense except as a clever symbolic reversal. What does this image remind you of? It really looks more like a mass demonstration, or a worker strike, than a police formation. It looks like the masses coming out to the streets in protest, forming a crowd and moving spontaneously, which in real life is met precisely with cops standing on the other side ready to enforce repression. This symbolic reversal takes the aesthetics of mass rebellion and places it on the forces of law and order, presenting them as the true expression of the spirit of the people. Bain's revolutionaries, on the other hand, tell them to disperse or we will shoot, exactly what cops would say in real-life clashes on the streets. The portrayal of protests and riots in Joker at least reverses this symbolism to place it back on its feet. Their opposing relations to the police are also visually illustrated in the poster for The Dark Knight Rises, which shows Batman standing on a police car as its protector, which is then subverted in Joker, which ends with Arthur Fleck dancing on top of a police car, symbolizing his overcoming of law and order. When Christopher Nolan does depict class division, he always does it in moralizing terms. He shows, for instance, a stock trader having his boots shined, who then throws a dollar bill at the shoe shiner, signifying just what a bad person he is. But this is done only so that, by contrast, the myth of the good, moral capitalist could be propped up in the form of the Wayne family. Christopher Nolan is worried about extreme wealth inequality, but his solution to it is a moral one. The nice philanthropic capitalist who cares about the people that he rules over. This comes straight out of Charles Dickens, who also makes a distinction between the good capitalist who finances orphanages and the bad greedy capitalist. This moralizing type of framing shows up again and again in anti-revolutionary rhetoric. By focusing on the moral character of members of the ruling class, the spotlight is taken off the way society is structured in the first place, obscuring the fact that the poor and the ruling classes have opposing interests by virtue of their class position itself, independently of whether they're good people or not. The economic struggle is reduced to a moral one. Some people argue against a political reading of Joker by pointing to the fact that the Joker himself in the movie says that he was not acting out of political motivations. But obviously, just because someone identifies as apolitical does not mean that they are not affected, influenced, or conditioned by politics, or that their actions have no political significance. In fact, it is often people who claim to be apolitical who are the most ideological of all, because they're not even conscious of the way they are influenced by politics, and thereby become powerless in the face of political influences. Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy consists of some of the most ideological movies I've ever seen, and he claims that they are not intended to be political. Even the director of Joker, Todd Phillips himself, says that the Joker is not a political film. But to reduce the meaning of a movie simply to what the director says about it is actually a pretty impoverished method of analysis. The meaning of any piece of media is always multi-layered, and includes, among other things, its influences, the conditions under which it was conceived and produced, the social and cultural context in which it was placed, and the cultural impact it has as well. And nothing points to the political resonance of the movie more than the fact that after its release, protesters around the world were seen wearing Joker-style makeup. Not far-right incels like people had feared, but genuine mass movements, from Chile to Lebanon. It is partly because Arthur Fleck lacks a political framework through which to understand his own life that he can only respond to an alienating society through spontaneous outbursts of destruction. And the fact that he isn't conscious of the way his life is shaped by politics only makes him more realistic as a character. My argument that his acts have a political significance by no means entails that he is a revolutionary to be commended or emulated. Rather, his political significance comes from the fact that he is a symptom expressing the social ills of our world. When he kills three drunk Wall Street brokers on the subway, he does it partly out of self-defense and partly out of a thirst for destructive transcendence, rather than any political principle. 
but on the collective level, his violence becomes a symbol that inspires crowds of demonstrators and protesters on the streets who lash out against the existing society through protests that burst into riots. Despite his lack of political consciousness, Arthur Fleck does feel a spontaneous sense of solidarity with the rioters because of their shared experiences of poverty and a shared rejection of the existing world. This also quite accurately reflects the world we live in, with its growing number of riots around the globe. According to data from 2020, civil unrest, in the form of both protest and riots, has doubled in the past decade, as an increasing number of people find existing social conditions intolerable and have little faith in the state's ability or willingness to address them. The French philosopher Alain Badiou has referred to our time as an age of riots, characterized not only by a proliferation of riots, but an increase in their historical significance. Referring to the economic crash of 2008, he argued that, quote, the crisis has shown in a very clear way that contemporary capitalism is incapable of tracing out a future for humanity. We can speak of a crisis of confidence in the capacity of capitalism to promise, notably to young people, a stable future, one they have a stake in. Arthur Fleck would have been relatively happy to continue working as a clown even under exploitative conditions, but the decaying society that the movie portrays fails to guarantee any future, let alone one without exploitation, as society's capacity to reproduce itself as such is put into question. In this age of riots, people acting out against the absence of a stable future form social non-movements, a term coined by the Iranian-American sociologist Asev Bayat. Social non-movements are, quote, the collective action of dispersed and unorganized actors who trigger social change without being guided by an ideology or recognizable leaderships and organizations. Bayat says that such non-movements entail a revolution without revolutionaries, and that large numbers of people participate in explosive uprisings without basing themselves on strategic visions or concrete programs. The fact that Arthur Fleck, therefore, does not identify with any particular political ideology is entirely consistent with the riotous non-movements of our times, which, without a shared worldview, formal organization, or program, are instead united by their shared rejection of the existing society. Badiou said in an interview that, in these movements, these immediate riots, while there is no veritable political ideology, they do have a symbolism. And symbolism is exactly what the Joker provides the rioters. The clown mask becomes a shared sign, and therefore an expression of popular power. The more people adopt this mask, the more power they gain, and even Arthur Fleck himself feels empowered by it when he sees protesters wearing the clown masks. This function has a lot of real-world examples, from the way the yellow vests function in the French protests of 2018, the way black masks function in black bloc tactics, or even the Guy Fox mask during Occupy Wall Street. It is therefore no coincidence that following the release of Joker, protesters from popular movements across the world were seen wearing Joker makeup. The function of Batman's mask is the exact opposite, and here again we see their opposing class standpoints. Whereas the Joker's mask serves to unite the individual with the wider power, Batman's mask is meant to single him out as an individual raised above the masses. The Dark Knight's mask is a sign of exclusivity, an exclusivity made possible by his economic status, which allows him to acquire military-grade armor and equipment. It signifies his individual superiority, hence why he scolds and reprimands those that seek to follow his example by making custom bat suits of their own. What gives you the right? What's the difference between you and me? I'm not wearing hockey pants. Batman's mask is thus closer to the symbols of the riot police, their uniform or their badge, as impersonating them is a punishable offense rather than an expression of solidarity. It's a symbol signifying that they have power over you. I'm not part of the world anymore, but I'm, you're somebody else. Oh, yeah. behind it. oh no, it's completely detached from. Yeah. That shows. Well, I guess that's useful in in the field as well. Does it? It definitely would have make you stop feeling like. If you're, in, you know, if you're using the right control, it'd be fantastic. Oh yeah. So much less personal. Right, right. Well, like you're not you're not a human. You're just you're just doing the job. Yeah. Exactly. What, what about? But you can see the other people. Yeah. They look like humans. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. See people. It's just okay. you just sort of. Which 
so much like this. Yeah, it's not you. It's funny, yeah, so. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, no, it's cool. Referring to the global growth of riots, an article in the Endnotes journal wrote that, quote, these non-movements are not in any sense revolutionary in themselves. They are closer to what Jacques Camat has recently called passive revolts, subjective expressions of the objective disorder of our times. They reflect, above all, the growing delegitimization of politics in a context of ongoing stagnation and austerity. And it's not just the riots, but the Joker himself in this movie that is a subjective expression of the objective disorder of our times. Christopher Nolan depicts the Joker as an agent of social chaos, but here we are shown that he is first and foremost a product of social chaos. It is always an open question whether a mass riot will remain a merely negative rejection of society, or whether it can transcend this rejection to arrive at a more positive vision of what needs to be done, a concrete transformation of society, whether it can become what Baidu calls a historical riot. Riots, by virtue of their collective character, have a latent potential for something greater, because in unifying a great number of people into a mass, they resist the social atomization created by capitalism. It is notable that the first act of human solidarity we see in Joker comes towards the end of the movie, when a group of rioters rescue Arthur Fleck from a police car. In this otherwise grim and socially barren environment, it is in protest and rebellion that we see a glimmer of light. In the midst of a devastating condemnation of society, we are simultaneously shown a potential way out. And now I'd like to thank my alienated supporters who make an idol of me on Patreon. Apply Quine that doesn't work on 37th Call, 404 Error, Just Undo It, A B, A Sociology of Tarot, A Gath the Go, Andre Oliva, Archive Transients, Celsius Enjoyer, Christopher, Clam Tears, Colin Pauli, Daniel Zotner, David Reese, Evie Rosk, Eric Owens, Gub Gub Kol Kol, Harbin Moths, Hong Kong Aesthetics. I would also like to thank this episode's sponsor, Brilliant Being, Jonah Shi, John De Pagani, Jones Indiana, Katochne, Katy Perry is John Bennett Ramsey, Clemen Fies, LMD24 Strain, M. Lim, Marco Rochetto, Matthew Richards, Max Bendick, Merciless, Nathaniel Lark, Paul Winfer, Polcat, Rachel Ann, Radical Q, Slevin Oliveres, Stax Murder, Tendies123, The Empty Set, Venice, Victor Redco, What If They Made a Stalin Funko Pop, Huh? What Then, Huh? Yavin Arba, Zim, as well as all of these wonderful patrons. I know these two movies have already been discussed to death a bunch, and I'm a little late to the discussion, but I hope you learned something new anyway. My next video will probably be a historical one about left-wing terrorism in the 1970s, although I'm not sure when it'll come out, as I'll be traveling and won't have my microphone set up for a while. Please forgive the wait. If you'd like to access the video script, occasional supplementary video notes, reading material, and polls on what video topics you want to see, you can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, where I also occasionally post updates about upcoming videos. I hope you're having a nice summer. Thank you.